welcome one welcome all to journal through the bible in a year challenge and as you can see on the screen uh, things are a bit different and uh, not, not only do we have part one of the journal through the bible the pentateuch but now we have part two coming up and i have so much to share about part two and how you can access that but of course we are here to journal through the scriptures and our chapters, our chapters today are going to be, ooh, there's some sharp noise here, um, chapters 15 of Deuteronomy to 34. So we want to finish the book of Deuteronomy. Let's see if we can do it and go over these, uh, these amazing, amazing chapters. So I hope you have your Bibles ready and that uh, you are ready to begin. Okay, make sure there's not too much. A volume there and all right reducing the uh, the gain as well all right we have a special whatsapp group that you can join right now it's free and you can have what we call daily deep dives into the bible where we have a daily check-in we go over the three chapters and we juice out the chapters and, and share what god is speaking to to us and then once we do that, we come here on YouTube to share some insights and recaps. But if you want the real deal, then join the WhatsApp group. As you do that, be aware of scammers. Make sure you have WhatsApp uh, two-step authentication uh, uh, on, your, on your phone. And make sure that it's safe and it's not easily scammable. All right. Why we do this is because 9% of people, Christians that is, have not yet read their Bibles and we're here to help people read their Bibles um, throughout or in a year and as we do that we have a special uh, seven step process that we use it's called the seven P's method you ask yourself all these uh, P's and answer them and once you're done you should have a good a good grasp of what God is saying all right so, before we proceed, let me share the good news. How many of you are ready for the good news? So, here's the good news. Today is the 26th of uh, Feb. Within a few days, the month is over and March is marching here. And with March comes so much more. With March, we have an amazing announcement to make, and that is, come on now, Journal Through the Bible in a Year Challenge Part 2. So Part 1 has Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Part 2, as you can see on the screen, has Joshua to Esther. I think this will be the longest so far anyways. And so this is exciting because it means that our journal through the Bible is progressing forward, that we're moving on, that we're leaving no one behind, and we want to experience his story. So this part two is going to be called his story. And the reasoning behind that is because these, biblically speaking, are called the history or historical books of the Bible. Where there's history, First Kings, Second Kings, Joshua, Judges, Esther, Ruth, and all these these books, but the 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 concept here is that every story in the Bible is actually a reflection of a bigger story of God. So when you look at the story of Ruth, God is telling His story through Ruth and Naomi and through Esther. God is telling His story, and that's why we want to discover and embrace and experience so super super duper excited about this now if i could share my screen again and take you to the website obviously we used to only have the uh the pentateuch but now we have part two here and then after the history we're gonna go into the wisdom books which will include uh books like psalms job um ecclesiastes you know these amazing books and then we'll go into other books here, as you can see here. We'll look at the prophets, the gospels, and, and then lastly, we'll be looking at the epistles. 
but now i want to show you how do, do you, you see how do you sorry about that sorry about the noise how do you access <laughs> that actually scared me guys um how do you access the history journal because it starts with march first so how do you make sure you're ready well you click on it and as you can see it's actually not free anymore as i said this one won't be free for many reasons including that it's not free and you're going to appreciate the value of this journal and this is just the digital version so if you look at the digital version of this journal um it has clickable chapters where you can actually you know just like the previous journal we have you have clickable chapters and then what else do you have in there i think that's the main thing and that's the real value we're providing and so get the journal get it for your friends if you can't afford this journal uh you can and you know someone who can afford it you can ask them to donate so once you donate to journal through the bible you make the journal and other um resources we have here accessible to everybody and when I say resources, there's so many resources that we've been having here, um, like the Bible resources, the books of the Bible resources, and many other things. When you donate, you make the Bible journal experience accessible to many people. And you decide how many people you want to help by the amount of donations you provide. So that's pretty much what we have as far as the next steps of our journal through the Bible and what am i missing here that's pretty much everything so now let's go straight into our journal through the bible for today all right here we go share this tab so this is how the journal looks like except it won't be free anymore after the end of this month so you come to the chapter of the day we're starting with deuteronomy 15 before we proceed let's pray our father who is in heaven thank you so much for the for your presence for the power of your word and for your intention with us your children i pray father that as we read your word that you may read our minds and show us our sins our errors our rebellion our stiff nakedness that we may turn to you with a broken heart and that we may seek you and desire after you is my prayer in jesus name amen so this is an exciting chapter and when i read it i was like wow so it says at the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release and then it says, and this is of the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends out unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is of the Lord's release. Of a foreigner, the, of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, etc., etc. And verse 4 is particularly interesting. It says, save when there shall be no poor among you. For the Lord shall greatly Bless thee in the land which told that God gives thee for an inheritance to possess it. And then last verse was also very interesting to me. It says, For the Lord thy God bless, blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou, thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. So we see that God's purpose was not poverty, but prosperity. God's purpose, according to this verse, uh, this passage anyways, is not being conquered by conquering, not borrowing, but actually lending. But let's look at the quotes here that we have. So from Patriarchs and Prophets 532, it says, The observance of the sabbatical year was to be, uh, to be a benefit to both the land and to the people, the soil lying untilled for one season would afterward produce more plentifully the people were released from the pressing labors of the field and while there were various branches of work that could be followed during this time all enjoyed greater leisure which afforded opportunity for the restoration of their physical powers 
for the exertions of the following years. So there's that principle of rest and work in play here. But my emphasis is how God says, I don't want poor people among you. And this is why I want you to do this practice. Where the, after seven years, you forgive each other's debts and you let go and you move on. Because God says, I'm going to bless you. You won't borrow. You will lend. Not just two people, but many nations. Like the, the global impact of this is really screaming loud. And obviously this is taken from Genesis where God says, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, what do we have here? None need fear that their liber liberality would bring them to want. Obedience to God's commandments would surely result in prosperity. Isn't that cool? Liberality is the, the practice of giving, being liberal, you know? And we are told you that, you know, don't be afraid that if you give, then you won't have. Actually, giving is how you have. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating principle of God, that God has put in place. That the more you give, the more you receive. So, anyways. But that, that was my highlight, anyways, from this, um, from this chapter. And then there's the law of the slaves. Won't go into that much. Please go read the chapter for yourselves. We're just looking at a few... Um, insights from the chapters looking at the seven p's at least one p from each chapter and from this chapter so far we see the principle of we see the principle of rest and work but also above above and beyond that the principle that god wants prosperity for his people and not poverty that poverty is not god's idea the poverty is not God's design, okay? In fact, I was saying in, um, was it from this chapter? I think I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it back as we, as we keep on going. Maybe in chapter 18, it's going to come back, don't worry. Let's look at chapter 16. What do we have in chapter 16? What stood out the most? So there's three major festivals and God tells them to observe them all. And he tells them, mm, okay, good. Yes, found it. So this is the verse I want us to, to highlight in connection with the principle we, we've started exploring already. It says, three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of the tabernacles and they shall not appear before the lord empty every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the lord thy god which he hath given thee so the principle that stood out to me and i'm a principal guy i guess I only look for the principles because the principle within the principle is embedded the promise and within the principle is embedded the pattern within like a principle has everything encapsulated so the principle is that our god is not a god of empty that our god is a god of abundance and of full and then as such he expects us not to be empty and he expects us not to be empty because he has given us he has given us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who, who has called us god has given us everything and through jesus he has literally given the whole of heaven so you cannot say you do not have because god has already given you everything that you need in fact when you think about it lack is is not god's idea lack is is a lie manufactured by the devil because there's no such thing as lack. God's people have everything they need. And God makes sure that they actually have everything they need. Every man shall give as he is able. Meaning every man is actually able to give. Interesting, right? So connecting back to the principle of, of um, God not designing poverty. Um, we see that 
emptiness or lack is not God's idea either in that he says, for my people, I'll make sure they have. Okay, what do we have here? Not as a dry theory where these things to be taught. Those who would impart truth must themselves practice its principles. Only by reflecting the character of God in the uprightness, nobility, and unselfishness of their own lives can they impress others. Oh, very good. Then you have the laws of sacrifices, etc., etc. Let's move on to chapter 17. There's more laws about sacrifices. Okay, wait. This one is interesting. Aha. Uh -huh. So, it says, If there's someone found among you who worships other gods, and worships them, the moon, the sun, etc., etc., then God says the person should be killed. And the emphasis for, as we're doing the daily deep dive actually was, um, God gives clarity on what he means by don't worship any other gods. He says the moon, the stars, the host of heaven, anything above heaven, under the heaven, on earth, etc. In other words, don't worship anything but me, God is saying. So if there's someone who worships other gods, they should they should be killed in the mouth of two or three witnesses everywhere should be established so the the question was why does god hate um idolatry so much and the same old message kept coming back god is a jealous god that that we cannot give god a divided heart because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There's no stability in this two-sided devotion where you worship God and then on top of that you have another God. Just doesn't work. Just doesn't work. Let's read verse 14 and 15. It says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and and shall say, I will set, <laughs> I will set a king over me. Like all the nations are about me. This is before they actually did this. Thou shalt, shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. So God wants to choose the king, one from among thy brethren, shall thou set a uh, king over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother when the israelites first settled in canaan they acknowledged the principles of the theocracy and the nation prospered under the rule of joshua but increase of population and intercourse with other nations brought a change and by intercourse is meant interaction the people adopted many of the customs of their heathen neighbors and thus sacrificed to a great degree their own peculiar holy character. Gradually, they lost their reverence for God and ceased to prize the honor of being his chosen people. And that's when they go on and say, oh, actually, never mind, we want our king, we want our own king, etc., etc. So this is what a king should not do. He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the lord had said unto you you shall not you shall henceforth return no more that way neither shall he multiply wives to himself uh oh solomon that his heart turn not away neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold and it shall be when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. You see the, the grace and the goodness of God, how even before crazy things happen, God provides a prevention for it. To say, oh, hey, be careful. This is a warning. Don't do this. And it shall be with him, uh, and it shall be with him 
and he, sh- and he shall read therein all the days of his life. The word of God is what actually rules, you know, um, that he may learn to, to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God is giving them the formula. What is the formula? My words. That is the formula for success. If you follow my word, you're all right. You'll be all right. Jumping on to Deuteronomy chapter 18, we read about the laws about the rightful dues for the priests and the Levites. And I think this is where we talk about uh, laws about, do you have laws about tithing here? This is chapter 18. Best fruits, minister. Okay. I want us to focus on. Oh, yes, here. Verse 9. Deuteronomy 18 from verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So the Canaanites, the, the Gergeshites, the Perizzites, they're all driven out because of these things. This is like a no, 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 you don't do this. And then God tells them, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. Now there's an interesting comment here that I want us to consider. It says, it's from one of my favorite books actually, Great Controversy. It says, spiritualism, spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands. Yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in legislative bodies, and even in the courts of kings, this mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. So this whole thing about the new age movement, the this and that, spiritualism, the universe, energy, all these things we need to be careful because it is simply a revival of this this witchery and wizardry and charming and divination palm reading all these things god says don't do it it's a no-no you don't do that okay let's talk about a prophet i think there was oh no this is different this is different never mind um this is actually a prophecy about jesus i believe so let's let's read and see. The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy children like unto me, and to him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, um, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken i will raise them a prophet from among their brethren like unto them and i'll put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that i shall command him and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name i will require it of him But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if 
thou say in thine heart how shall we know the word which the lord hath not spoken when a prophet speaks the name of the lord if the thing follow not nor come to pass that is the thing which the lord hath not spoken but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously thou shalt not be afraid of him so that's really powerful stuff and i believe there's another verse here maybe it's the one that follows 19 chapter 19 Oh no, this is different. This is laws about the cities of refuge. I think we may have skipped something. Let me see if I can find it. I'll go back a bit. Not 18, not 17. Maybe 14. No, it can't be. Okay, well, let's go to 19 then. When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations, whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. So let's talk about the cities of refuge and you, you notice that most of these things are repeated because numbers give us a real deal about what these cities are and how they operate. But let's kind of do some quick recap. So the cities of refuge appointed for God's ancient people were a symbol of the refuge provided in Christ. The same merciful savior who appointed those temporal cities of refuge has by the shedding of his own blood provided for the transgression of God's law a sure retreat into which they may flee for safety from the second death. No power can take out of his hands the souls that go to him for pardon. So this is the, the good news. Then here he continues to say, He who fled to the city of refuge could make no delay. Family and employment were left behind. There was no time to say farewell to loved ones. His life was at stake, and every other interest must be sacrificed to one purpose, to reach the place of safety. Weariness was forgotten. Difficulties were unheeded. The fugitive dared not for one moment slacken his pace until... He was within the wall of the city. And this is the same speed that we need. The haste. The, it's called the haste of the Passover. They have to do it in haste. Because you cannot delay. You have to do it quickly. Because this is about your salvation, right? So you can't say, I'm going to you know, make the decision for Christ tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. It has to be now. As Hebrews tells us that today if you hear his voice, do not, ha uh, do not harden your hearts. As in the days of provocation. But today if you hear his voice. You should say. Here I am Lord send me. So more laws are repeated. Which you can find in the book of Numbers. But I think what we may have to do is. I, I, I wasn't really. Considering that it's going to be a lot to cover in one in one video maybe we can end at chapter 20 in chapter 20 it talks about the laws about warfare and going into war all right let's do from verse 10 when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it then proclaim peace unto it and it shall be if you make the answer of peace and open unto thee then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee. And if it make no peace with thee, but will will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands. Thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. Wow. So let's read this. To many, these commands seem to be contrary to the spirit of love and mercy enjoined in other portions of the Bible. But they were in truth the dictates of infinite wisdom and goodness. God was about to establish Israel in Canaan to develop among them a nation and a government that should be a manifestation of his kingdom upon the earth. So this is chapter 20 
we have 10 more chapters to to go so i think i'll, I'll finish here today it's only been 30 minutes i feel like we can still go what do you guys think should we still go No, I think uh, I think uh, 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 I think we'll stop here for now. Then we'll come back. We'll come back later for you. But please go to journalthroughthebible.com. Get ready for the new episode that's coming. This uh, volume. Get the, get your copy. And I, I believe it's also on Amazon right now. If we do journal through the Bible in a year challenge. Oh wow. Part one. Where's part two? Okay, I think it's still processing with Amazon. But once it's ready, I'm gonna share with you all so that you can experience journal through the Bible. You can get it on Amazon, get the digital version. That's perfectly fine as well. I just want to thank you so much for joining me today as we're journaling through the Bible. May the good Lord bless you as we continue tomorrow uh, in two chapters. Maybe tomorrow or the day after we'll be doing chapters um, 21 to 34. So thank you so much. God bless you and see you next time as we continue to journal through the Bible. Please, please tell your friends about journal through the Bible tell them about this experience why are you keeping this to yourself let them know that we are aggressive this year and we want to hear god speak to us every single day thank you so much see you next time